Um, so, thank you so much for having me over and for coming to this remote room. Um, I'm really happy to be able to share something and hopefully teach you something new as well. Um, my name is Maciej and I'm a, I work as a data, data scientist at Rainforest, where we, do, uh, where we use lots of crowdsourcing to make our product work. And before we start, I'm just really interested to have any of you used something like Mechanical Turk or Crossflower or something like this to get data? Uh, is anyone willing to share like what you did and what kind of problems you had with it? Um, <coughs> I used it to uh, basically go through transcripts of interviews that people have done with people regarding disease outbreaks. Okay. And we would use it to tag certain keywords in there. Okay. And was it, uh, like, did you get good results? Was it, you... We haven't had a ton of people use it, and the results we got were spectacular, but we right. had a big sample set. Okay. So, um, the biggest problem for us is, is kind of related is that it's kind of difficult to have reliable quality when you ask people to do stuff. So, there are different ways of doing crowdsourcing. The, the one we use because of mechanical tech, we pay people some pennies for every small task they do. Um, and there is a bunch of trade-offs and things you have to think about when you, um, when you do that. So there are a few parts uh, to this talk. I will tell you about the kind of data that we, that we gather, that we have, the way we model it, and how we use it to sort of improve our product. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of technical stuff about, some, about machine learning that we did, um, but the part that I kind of that we all realized recently is that we're missing quite a bit of empathy for our testers, for people who work for us. And I will highlight <coughs> how important it is uh, by the end of the talk. So the first part is the data. And I have to tell you a little bit about what Rainforest does. I, will, I promise not to sell you too much on that. But basically, we, use, uh, we provide QA as a service. So if someone has a company and they're building up a QA team, we try to replace the QA team, so to make sure that people can just use our service instead of uh, building a team. And we use humans to, to basically find uh, problems in web, web applications. So the way, uh, what, what the customer does when they, um, they want to test the application, they just write the test in English. So they say, okay, the, the tester should go to this URL, do something, and then they ask a question. Is the page okay? Does the logo show up in the right place and so on? Uh, so that's an example of one test. There's just one single step. It says, go to this URL, look at the page, does the image look okay? And then the corresponding thing that the workers on, on the house micro task uh, markets do, they have the instructions, they read them, uh, and they answer the question by following the instructions in the terminal. So you can see below there's a terminal with a sort of right browser version that allows the uh, mechanical tech or Cloudflower workers to follow the instructions and check whether the website actually works. So what kind of problems might there might be to that? Uh, first of all, testers might not be able to understand the instructions. They're not all native English speakers. Not all the tests are written uh, clearly. So that's, that's something we have to overcome. Uh, even if they understand uh, the question, they might not know what to do in a specific scenario. There's lots of ambiguities, like is this a bug, how, how precise it was supposed to be, and so on. And finally, even if they do understand everything, they might still, because we're paying them for it, they might still want to just cheat and click yes, 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 everything is fine, as, as fast as possible, just to get money. So that's also something we have to think about. And what kind of solutions uh, we can use to, to deal with these things? There's first of all training, we to make sure people know what to do. Uh, we can set up incentives correctly. Um, we can track people that we sort of that have been with us for a while and have high reputation. Uh, we can trust them more than others. We can have multiple people do the same thing to get some redundancy. And finally, the, the sort of the technical focus of this talk is, is this idea based on the paper from 2011, where they um, figured out whether people were actually doing the work they were supposed to do or not by looking at input patterns, by gathering data and, and training a classifier. Um, and this is also what we have done. So the way we capture the data is, 
using a virtual machine. And the terminal that you've seen is a virtual machine, and everything that happens there is recorded. So all the mouse moves and keyboard uh, inputs and uh, network requests between the browsers. Um, and this is how it looks like. If you we, we could also capture screenshots. So if you see, uh, if the tester sees a login page and they click on username and password and paste things in, we can we capture that and we know what they did. So knowing that, um, we have these. Our data is basic, basically a collection of things: uh, a feature vector describing the the work that people did, and a label saying this is good work or it's lazy work that we that we should uh, not take into account. Um, feel free to shout out if you want to sort of creatively think up features that we can uh, create from that. So what we have is all these, all these mouse movements that you've seen and what people clicked, and we need to turn it into a string of numbers, a uh, uh, feature vector. So feel free to shout, but I can also show you what we've actually done. Um, you can do things like count the number of clicks, try to get the speed and the acceleration of the, of the mouse cursor, number of keys, the presence of specific combinations of keys, like copy and paste, for example. Uh, you can try to look for keywords in the test instructions. So there's a, for example, keyword click. There's probably, there should probably be at least one click detected, and so on and so on. And there's lots of, it's kind of fun to experiment with the things and try to think up new combinations of different, different things that you can, uh, that might be informative, and then using so we're using Python and the scikit-learn package, which is really awesome and it makes it really easy to look at things like feature importance and iterate on your, um, on your pipeline. Um, so the second part is labeling the data. Uh, we capture everything, but we don't know uh, out of the box whether a given piece of work is good or not. And that needs hand labeling. So what we do is uh, we send a weekly email to all developers with a few links asking them to tell us, like, okay, is this good work or is this bad work? And that the interesting part there is how to select which data to label. We have some you know, tens of or hundreds of thousands of data points every week, and only like, 20 developers, and asking them to do even 10 uh, labelings per week is already stretching. So we can only sort of have information about a tiny fraction of, uh, of our data. Um, so at first we just had a completely random selection of, uh, of things to label. Then once we got enough data to, to train the first version of the classifier and we verified that it was working well enough, we split it in half and 50% was the random and the other 50% we, uh, we sort of chose the, the worst offenders, the <coughs> most lazy work we could find to, to check whether the classifier was working correctly or not. But now we're actually moving back to random because random selection. Because there are actually two purposes for labeling. One of them is improving the performance of the classifier and, and gathering data. And that's what sort of that's when it's good to have some kind of bias. But there's also another uh, purpose which is to evaluate the health of your system overall. So to see whether some changes you do are having a good effect or not. And to do that to do that, you need to have sort of a representative sample and having uh, a bias there like we used to have is, is really bad. It doesn't really allow us to say anything in front. Um, there's also just a small part I want to mention. It, it gets pretty technical, but if you're, if you're doing a classification and your data set is unbalanced, which means that you have many more samples from one class than the other class, uh, you might run into problems. There are different algorithms deal differently with this kind of scenarios. Uh, and there are methods for uh, balancing your data set. You can throw out some data or you can come up with new data, uh, depending on, the, and there are different trade-offs. Trade um, but first of all, always try being naive. To say, <coughs> I'm just going to try what works and just make sure you have good metrics. So we used to you do data balancing because majority of the work in our system is actually good and only a small proportion is bad. Um, but we discovered we don't actually need to explicitly balance the data and it's fine, as long as you can prove that you're classification is, is good enough. Um, I'm not going to explain sub something and super something in too much detail. Um, so moving on to the model, uh, it's a runoff forest. If some of you are familiar with, that, with machine learning algorithms in general, runoff forests are really popular, they're really sort of easy to use and uh, easy to understand. Um, 
and we use them for binary classification with uh, the features that I have shown you before. Uh, the remaining part is how to... Uh, the random forest can give you a classification, basically in our case it's, it's a class, so either a 1 or a 0, but it can also give you a probability. So we use the probability and the cap to uh, be able to adjust the threshold to kind of the risk level that we are comfortable with. Um, and finally, uh, a while ago, I did this exploration and I had my Jupyter notebook with all the code running and I thought, okay, great, I've got my, uh, I solved the problem. And then some people I work with said, okay, sure, that looks good, let's, let's use it for something. And then I was like, okay, so how do I actually put it into, the, into production? Um, so what we need is something like this. We wanted to have some web service that is sitting uh, on a server and communicates with our own application, receives a bunch of JSON, does the magical classification, and returns a bunch of JSON um, back to say this is good work or this is bad work. Of course, the application also has some database behind it. And this is all you need once you have your model trained. So once you did all your analysis, you you train your model and you save it somewhere and your prediction service can use it. If you want to train your model, you probably would do something like this. So because otherwise you need to send lots of data through, uh, through your application to, to the service. Uh, but this is generally a good idea because now you have two different things talking to the same database and if you end up chasing, changing the schema of your database, you need to adjust two things at the same time. Uh, so that's generally not a good idea. There are other ways around it. Uh, and every time you have to sort of consider the trade-offs. In our case, we do not need to do uh, the retraining too often, like once a week, once a month is fine, so we can just do it locally uh, in a manual way. So we access the, uh, the data on our either a dump of the data on a local machine or something like this, do the training, verify it, and then, and then actually use it. Um, there are a bunch of other requirements as well. Uh, the most important one for us was to be able to debug when something goes wrong. Because machine learning is slightly a, uh, it's a slightly different way of operating than regular software development. There was a really interesting paper from Google uh, that had a title like Machine Learning, the High Interest Credit Card of Technical Debt. Uh, it's, there are lots of pitfalls when you sort of create this magical black box that does classification for you and you don't really know what's going on inside. Um, so if you are using something like machine learning in production, you need to take care of uh, saving enough information together with it to be able to uh, not only re-instantiate your objects, but also recreate them. And I'll talk about that uh, in a second, but the, the rest of the application is pretty simple. It's just a web service, returns a bunch of data, gives it to the classifier, who returns it back as JSON. That's all there is to it. Uh, the interesting part is how to load a trained model uh, into, into memory to be able to use it. Uh, are people familiar with Python here? So if you are, you probably know what this is. Uh, this is a pickle. And there is a Python module called pickle that allows you to take an object you have uh, in, in Python and serialize it down to a file. That way you can save it for later and read it back. Uh, but there are problems with it. First of all, there are, uh, depending on what you're serializing, there are different packages. So, for example, joblib is a package that's bundled with scikit-learn that's more efficient at serializing numpy arrays. So, that's great for, for <coughs> scikit-learn estimators. But uh, there are also other considerations. So, three years ago at PyCon, there was an interesting talk about why you should never use people, basically. Um, and I encourage you to, to watch it if, if you're interested, but the, the main problems are that you are making a bunch of non explicit assumptions when you're serializing something. You implicitly uh, depend on versions of your packages, and unless you take extra care, you will have, you, you'll run into pro problems in the future. And also it's really insecure. So if you, if you, serialize, if you try to deserialize a file that someone gives you, that basically leads to remote code execution, so only deserialized objects that, that you're really sure are uh, safe. Um, and if you look at, uh, at the documentation of scikit-learn, uh, all these kind of things are mentioned there, and we wanted to do basically follow the, 
good practices. So we have created a small Python package called Destimator, which you can, it's open source, you can download it, and basically it wraps your scikit-learn estimator in a class together with a bunch of metadata that, that you give it, and then you can serialize it. It doesn't do anything to uh, help you with security, uh, but it makes it slightly easier to, to bundle and ship trained machine learning models. Um, so it has some limitations. We're, so far, as far as I know, the only people using it, so if there's something uh, you would like Destimator to have that would be that would make it useful for you, uh, let me know and I'm, I'm happy to, to improve it. Uh, but finally, uh, the, the other part of the talk is about actually considering whether technical solutions are suitable for what you want to do. So, because we deal with humans, we need to understand what they do and, and why. And if you ever need to do some work on, uh, on mechanical tech, make sure you spend some time as a worker yourself, at least a day or, I don't know, an hour a week for a period of time, uh, going through the tasks and just completing <coughs> uh, small things to get to know the system and really see how workers uh, behave and, and why. Uh, and also give people ways to talk to you. Like, this is pretty obvious now in retrospect, but we used to treat our workers as kind of, uh, we had our customers who were paying us, and our testers were just the nuisance that we have to use and kind of catch the bad criminals. But that's not the right way to think about it. We really have to understand them and, and talk to them, and listen and ask questions. And there's one more thing, like a short story I wanted to tell you. Uh, this is my dog, and I got her a few months ago. She's a border collie called Whiskey. And when I got her, uh, so border collies are great because they're really smart dogs, um, but if they get bored, they won't get distracted because they need something to occupy their mind. So when I got her, I started watching YouTube videos on how to train your dogs, and it's really fun. I can really recommend doing that. But uh, one, thing that really, one thing that really stuck for me is this really cheesy notion of uh, setting them up for success. So, if you have a small dog, and for example, you want to teach them to sort of count to you when, when you call them, uh, you cannot start by putting your dog 20 meters away and then just trying to get them to come over. They will not understand it. You have to start like half a meter away and say, I'm in the ear, and when they count, you give them a reward. And you do it over and over again, and then you take a step back, and then you do this again. And then you gradually increase the distance. And at every point, uh, it's really obvious for the dog uh, what to do. And uh, the step to the next level is, is kind of manageable. If you give them, if you want them to jump from zero to one, immediately they won't get it. And I don't mean to imply that training dogs is the same as teaching people, but I think some of the same principles apply. And I know that when I'm learning something, it's <coughs> obviously much easier to uh, learn things in small gradual improvements rather than get the whole concept at once. So, ah, and this is whiskey. Recently, she <laughs> learned to successfully tear up, tear up my bank statements. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, this, the same thing applies with your uh, crowdsourcing. Make sure you train people progressively and give them a, an easy path to, to do the right thing. Um, and this is basically it. So we have some, like the whole approach um, that we took has some limitations. Our, Data capture is not always reliable, so if we miss some clicks, which happens, we get wrong classification. So that's also something we have to take into account. And it requires lots of labeling effort. So uh, there are some smarter way, uh, things we could do. There's a thing called active learning that looks at the unlabeled data and tries to select the points that, uh, if you label them, the classification should improve. Um, we could also do something more meta to try to get workers to verify other workers' work. Um, but it, it also comes with a bunch of problems that we haven't yet found solutions for. Um, and the, the, only, the main takeaways I would like to, to impress upon you uh, today is that, first of all, seriously evaluate whether your technical solution is the right thing to do at the time. So we're pretty happy with where we are now, but if we started thinking about empathy before we implemented all this, we have probably gotten to where we are faster, and we will be, we will be happier. Uh, also, make sure you respect your community and uh, people you work with, even if, they're, even if they're not your customers, they are still, um, they're still sort of rational human beings, so make sure you understand their perspective. 
And at the end of the day, machine learning is still useful and it's a really cool thing to do, but it's not always, in every situation, the biggest bang for the buck. And with that, thank you very much. So, when, I'm just, just sort of imagining that when you started this, you had some, at some point, somebody proposed a hypothesis that machine learning could help you evaluate the quality of the work right. you're doing. How long did it take you in, in your company in this effort to decide whether it was actually useful or not? And what were the criteria to actually say, you know what, this actually is going somewhere, let's put more time and investment into it? Um, so there was not really a formal process. We're still a fairly small company, and when I joined as the first data scientist, there were, I think, 10 of us. Um, and I had this idea, and people said, yeah, sure, sounds good, we trust you, go and do it. Uh, and that was basically it. Uh, so we spent maybe a week or two in sort of exploring it and plotting the data and trying to figure out whether there's, there's something we can find and whether the, the features that we could think of, can we, like, can we look at a data point and at the features that we can compute? And as humans, can we figure out whether it's a good work or not? And it wasn't very disciplined, it was kind of qualitative, um, but yeah, that's, that was the process we went through. In gathering feedback on mouse movements and keystrokes, mm -hmm. did you consider um, listening at the microphone with their permission? Uh, no, we haven't. So first of all, yeah, we do have their permission, and they are people who work for us, and they sort of, we tell them what it involves. Um, we didn't consider a microphone. Why would that be useful? Well, I guess that's sometimes that's for feature testing. Does you know if someone is right saying? Damn it, fuck. Right. <laughs> uh, that's, that's I suppose not really the kind of information you're trying to Right. Yeah. That's good. That's good to be useful. So I think it will be a little bit challenging at the moment. But no, we could probably make it work. Um, maybe something we should think of. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about using other testers as possible to validate? Sure. Test. Yeah. So so we do that uh, for each each task that that we have. Uh, we select at least three people to do the same thing, and then we look for consensus. Um, <coughs> there are still problems there because even if you, first of all, different people might get different results, even if they're all doing exactly the same thing. Even if they're supposed to be using, like testing the same service, sometimes there is like a random mark that occurs for one person and not the other. Uh, so we look for consensus, but we cannot really. Um, you, so, so if someone's work gets rejected because it doesn't agree with the majority, you cannot really use it to pen, penalize them because it would be unfair. Um, we are thinking of doing some more smarter ways to sort of look not only at uh, consensus in results, but also consens consensus in how they go about completing the tests, which we're not doing yet. Um, so that, that would be kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I think it's... it's uh, it's still kind of an active area of development for us. Uh, that yeah, would be interesting to see. All right. Thank you so much.